So Kevin Nosek's brother took an extra five minutes there. So for, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so we'll try to jump right into it. So I'm Stuart Buck, um, Executive Director of the Good Science Project, which is a um, organization focused on improving science funding, science policy. Um, and prior to that, I spent several years working in philanthropy at Arnold Ventures, formerly known as the Arnold Foundation, where I had the privilege of working with Brian uh, ten and a half years ago to help uh, plan and launch the Center for Open Science. That's one of the best experiences of my life. Thanks, Brian. Um, so the, the Meta Science Conference so far, as you've noticed, has focused, I think, largely on um, kind of the conduct and practice of science. So we've talked about diversity and collaboration and you know, what are scientists' incentives, the incentives they're facing. We've talked a lot about publications and publication bias, p-hacking, pre-registration, um, citation practices, uh, you know, all those sorts of issues. Um, but I think one huge issue is the role of government funders in, in incentivizing these practices and so forth. I mean, be, between NIH and NSF, which we have folks here um, who have worked or, did, or currently work at those institutions, um, we're spending nearly $60 billion in 2023, most of which flows to uh, academic scientists, of course. And I think there are at least three ways that, that government funders uh, can be tremendously important with regards to meta-science. One is just in encouraging good practices, encouraging good practices as to the conduct of science and to publication, um, or sometimes being neutral or maybe even thwarting good practices. Um, a second way is that government funders could actually fund uh, meta-science type studies, you know, the types of studies that many people in this, this room do. Um, and a third way that government funders are important is um, in conducting meta-science internally, you know, conducting experiments even within their own uh, practices, their own, uh, you know, uh, ways of handing out funding, conducting peer review, et cetera, um, so as to learn to improve, uh, you know, conduct a kind of internal improvement studies on themselves. And so the, the folks on this panel have participated in, in one or more ways with uh, kind of all those forms of the ways in which government funders um, can, can interact with meta-science. Um, so the way this is gonna work, we don't have any formal presentations, it's gonna be a kind of casual conversation, I'm gonna ask some questions of the panelists, um, and then a little later open it up for uh, audience Q&A. So, so, so to start off with a, kind of a softball question, what is your name? <laughs> Richard Nakamura. Neil Thacker. You didn't tell me you were gonna ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Tompkins, NSF. All right, now to step it up a little, maybe each of you could just say, say a few words about your biography, you know, your CV, so to speak, what, and you know, where, where you work or have worked with regards to government funders. I was formerly uh, the director of the Center for Scientific Review. I retired in 2018. Um, before that, I was scientific director of the National Institute of Mental Health and deputy director of the National Institute of Mental Health. I was in government doing program funding for, many, for a couple of decades. Overall, I spent 40 years within the federal government. Uh, I was a... Um director in the Health Services Research and Development Program at the VA, doing program evaluations, performance measurement, and uh, research uh, on the VA health system. And then I moved to NIH in 2005 to work on uh, open science issues. I don't know if we called it that back then, um, but I worked on the public access policy, data sharing policies, preprints, a bunch of stuff. And then in 2018, I moved to the ALS Association where I coordinate their research program, advocacy program, and uh, care services program. So I'm a recovering academic. I left the University of Nebraska in 2014 to join NSF, and I've been working at NSF and, and was drawn into the public access open science activities at the agency starting around 2015. So compared to my colleagues, I'm, I'm a newbie. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. So. All of you, as I said, have participated in promotion of uh, meta science, whether or not it was called that at the time. Um, so maybe, Alan, let's start with you and uh, talk about the NSF's uh, Science of Science or Science of Science policy. You know, the program has undergone various iterations, but it's involved in funding meta science. We are. So when I got to NSF, the uh, program that was called SciSIP at the time now called uh, Science of Science, had long been involved in funding Coach Nosek's brother and other <laughs> researchers uh, on a variety of issues. Uh, it's really expanded. 
Uh, and I, if we have time, I was just going to go through seven current projects that we're funding just to give you an idea. I feel like a car salesman. I want you to think that you can drive a research-funded project from NSF by the time we're finished today, because I think you can. We need to fund all sorts of uh, kinds of science, and that's why I wanted to tell you about that. But in addition to the science of science, which is in the social, behavioral, and economic sciences, which is where I work, also the computer science uh, program has developed and really uh, probably the leader at the agency on funding open science through uh, right now Martin Halbert is the program officer, and so many of you have heard about that. But NSF, um, we, you, know, you said the, the billions of dollars that we invest in, uh, across government, and NSF funds a lot of those, but not as many uh, dollars are invested in research. So there's a lot that's invested in the open science infrastructure repositories, things like that. And we just had a uh, uh, almost $40 million uh, investment that went to the University of Michigan a couple a year or so ago in which we were expanding their work. So one thing I do want to leave you with is public access open science is expensive. And uh, interestingly, we don't know what the return on the investment is. So Brian and others are uh, you know, committed to it. And, and we also uh, have those values, but we also say, where should the taxpayer dollars be invested and why? What do we get from it? Should every dissertation be open? Uh, curating that information so that others can replicate that takes a lot of time. So uh, I, I would like to know what works, under what circumstances, and why for public access open science, even beyond, yeah, we all want to share, but how, how, what, under what circumstances should we be sharing? Uh, Neil, perhaps you can talk a little more in depth about uh, your work on open science uh, matters at the director's office of the NIH. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I think to to frame this, one of the undercurrents of my time at NIH was this this theme about productivity and impact and efficiency in scientific activity. And even in my career, which is I guess getting longer now. Uh, we see more and more authors, the number of authors on a paper is increasing, the amount of collaboration is increasing, and that takes time. And one of the reasons why I think collaboration is increasing is because as the literature grows, people have to focus their knowledge into smaller and smaller areas of science, and then to do something meaningful, you have to work with more and more people of different um, backgrounds and stuff to, to do some work, and that all has cost. And so when I started in 2005, uh, the director at the time of NIH, um, Elias Zerhouni, talked about this concept of a digital lab assistant, um, some kind of bot or agent that could go through the literature every day, crawl through it automatically, and then tell you what are the interesting things that are happening in that field that can help you understand what's going on and help deal with that deluge of information that's being produced every year. In some ways, we're drowning from the productivity of our scientific enterprise. And you know now, almost 20 years later, we have a significant percentage of the literature that's machine accessible, and we have uh, a convergence of that data and the, our ability of computers to process that data. And so this is a very exciting time to see that. Um, but we're, of course, we're not there yet, and we're still left with these questions about productivity and value and um, the, the, the benefits of a scientific investment. And so I can talk about that later. That's sort of moving on to what I'm doing now currently and how I'm struggling with these issues. Would you? Yeah. So, so, so now I'm a, a research funder in a rare disease space in ALS, a disease that has no cure and moves very rapidly. And uh, we're constantly trying to leverage a small amount of funding 
and through our advocacy program and through that funding, additional funding from the government and other sources to make a big change in a disease that's poorly understood. And it's, it's very difficult to do that because in part, I don't know how to organize a scientific portfolio. I have ideas. I, there's a craft of science funding, but there isn't a science to it. And I would love to get that science. And I'll give you a, a very simple example. It's really hard to get diagnosed with a uh, neuromuscular degenerative disease right now. There's all kinds of complicated tests you need. You need specialists who have experience to do that. And it doesn't happen well. There's like a year delay. And so if we want to put out a problem-oriented uh, research call, call for, for research studies, and say, give us papers, give us uh, research applications on how to reduce the time to diagnosis by six months, we'll get a lot of papers on developing blood tests, biomarkers, imaging studies, things that may have a 15 to 20 year time horizon before they'll lead to a change in clinical care. And what we won't get, and I keep asking for this, what we won't get is, a, is studies on how to get into our messy health system to just get people referred more effectively. And that's just because the researchers in ALS don't do that kind of science. They don't pay attention to that. And if we do what science funders typically do is we just pick the best from the, the applicants that come on, we'll end up doing the 20-year study uh, time horizon and that means we're talking about four generations of people getting ALS and dying before that benefit comes, comes through. If we put out the same the RFA and say, give us an answer that's going to help people in five years, we would get a very different application. And I very rarely see across all of our spaces RFAs that give some kind of time to impact uh, in, their, in their research consideration. And I, I, I'm not sure why we do that when in any other kind of investment there's always a time horizon, an ROI horizon in that. And so I'm struggling how to think about that and talk about that. Now, Richard, when you were at uh, NIH at the Center for Scientific Review, uh, among other things, you led a fascinating experiment with uh, a peer review. So I'd love to hear from you about that. Sure. Um. When I arrived and was appointed director of the Center for Scientific Review, <clears throat> we had an interesting problem, a question of one, does peer review work to produce a prioritization of the best science? But even more important was, do we do this in a way that's unbiased, that's fair uh, to the scientific community? Are there prejudices involved uh, that are basically unfair and unrelated to the quality of science. Um, Donna Ginther and her colleagues had just done a study which showed, among other things, that there were significant racial and ethnic differences in the success rates of scientists. And among other things, it pointed out that black scientists receive 55% the success rate of white scientists. There were other smaller differences between um, Asian scientists and white scientists and uh, Latino scientists and white scientists. But this other one was really striking. And um, one of the advisory committees to the director suggested that uh, we think about doing a study of anonymization. That is, if we redacted information that gave clues on the race of investigators, would that change the score difference between black and white scientists? Because peer review is noisy, and because studies of this kind are expensive, um, we calculated that it would be impossible to compare all races and groups. But we did a, decided on a study which would compare um, 400 applications from black scientists against a match control group of 400 applications of white scientists. In addition, we decided to have a comparison group of randomly chosen white scientists designed to match 
the difference in success rate between white and black scientists. So with these three groups, we redid uh, review of full applications and review of applications that were redacted to remove all identifiers of the individual um, investigator. Um, this study, its overall design um, and its analysis was pre-registered with the Center for Open Science, a coincidence that's, um, that was very pleasant. And um, they were quite helpful in helping us think through um, how to pre-register uh, this study. The study took a long time. It was very expensive. It's not a study that's likely to be replicated. However, uh, what we found was that the peer review, uh, that is, we had uh, regular reviewers uh, do a review, and we only looked at the fully independent scores that these reviewers arrived at in both redacted and full application conditions. What we found is that the primary comparison, which was between the um, uh, white control scientists and, and the black scientists, I shouldn't call them controls, but, but the comparison group, um, there was no significant difference in the interaction between race um, and score. So, um, and group, and, and uh, race and um, the condition of the application. So in, in a sense, this was a busted experiment. What we found was that the noise levels were much higher in our study than in normal uh, peer review. So that our power analyses and calculations did not work to allow us to find, get a significant conclusion. However, we did find in the secondary analysis um, that the, um, when we compared the uh, white scientists in the randomized group and the black scientists, uh, that the difference in scores between the groups was halved in the redacted, in the redacted applications. And that was a significant finding. It was not only cut in half, but it was the white scientist scores that got worse, and the black scientist scores stayed the same. Um, this has led to a thought uh, that one of the possibilities is for NIH to offer the possibility of um, anonymized applications for um, review. I don't know if that um, will happen yet, um, but there is definitely some discussion going on about that possibility. So um, I think this is the kind of study, though, that the government needs to think about and continue to do um, to help. I'd like to add that more recent examinations of the difference in success rates between black and white scientists has shown that the difference, even though we continue to be the same when I retired, that is almost a doubling of success rates in, among white scientists, um, has been virtually eliminated. Why that is, I'm not sure. But right now, the success rate of the two groups is, is close to the same. I'll leave it there for now. Excellent. Um, so that's a fascinating experiment. And so it, it prompts an additional question that I um, would like to ask of anyone who wants to answer. Um, is why don't we see more experiments like that? In your case, it sounds like the experiment was particularly expensive because you had to redo review and you had to find some way of anonymizing applications, which can take a lot of staff time, I assume. Um, but one can imagine a number of experiments about various meta-science ideas that might be you know, much, much more cheap uh, to implement. Um, so I, guess, so I guess my question is, what are the obstacles uh, to that happening? Is it just internal bureaucracy? Is it external politics? Legal and ethics, you know, the, um, you know, there could be any number of reasons. But um, you know, why, why don't we see, you know, like one experiment like this every year for every billion dollars we hand out in funding, which would mean a new experiment every week, right? <laughs> so, to be provocative. From your lips to the funders' ears, I think. 
I think it would be great to do that. And Stuart, you and I were uh, here at the Academy about a month ago hearing about experimentation and federal funding. And one of the things we heard was the Novo Nordisk Foundation is undertaking a, a quite a, uh, an extensive effort. Uh, they're a private foundation, so they can do this. They don't have some of the constraints that publics do. Uh, but they're trying to understand the review process. They're looking at things, I think, like what you were just talking about. But in addition, they're looking at ideas. What if you give reviewers the option to select out and say, I really like that proposal. I really want to fund that. Even though you three don't like it, I really like it. And so they're trying to understand different iterations. But as you say, Stuart, if, if we don't lean in and do this kind of research, we're going to go the next 40 years without knowing really what's going on. I should say that Donna Ginther was funded by NSF for <laughs> that inquiry. And one of the embarrassments I have is she couldn't do it at NSF. NIH opened up their data. NSF did not. When I was at the VA, we, we would do evaluations of the health system, and we would find sometimes problems with the services that were delivered by the agency that funded us, and that would cause problems. And sometimes it was good enough to say, well, we found these problems because we looked for them, and now we can fix them, and that was, that was seen as a good thing, but sometimes that didn't matter, and it just meant that it was a, a justification to perhaps go after our budget. So these same issues that Brian was talking about earlier this morning about finding a problem and how you respond to that problem uh, is true for a government organization. But on top of that, you have people who are interested in changing the budget of that organization that have nothing to do with the integrity of that particular field of science. And so there is a, it, what seems like an additional uncontrolled element of risk that goes beyond an individual career, but I'm not a scientist in a university so I actually can't speak to that. It may be the same, the same risk uh, of being transparent. We, we had a saying in our office that, uh, what was it? Transparency sucks. And because we were the ones that were putting out all the data about what we funded and organizing it by disease category and budget, and it, it, it raised no uh, shortage of complaints and concerns. At, um, Federal agencies are very conservative when it comes to risk of revealing something that will affect their funding. And so that uh, tends to uh, provide a lot of caution. Um, I know that uh, I had to work fairly hard in order to allow some of the data from some of the studies that we did conduct uh, to be released. So I cooperated with outside scientists to enable um, them to look at certain aspects of our data, uh, such as uh, scoring of reviewers and whether or not there are correlations among uh, reviewers. And um, that was relatively uh, difficult to achieve initially, though the system uh, went along with it ultimately. And I think we know a lot more about um, the nature of scoring within the system, particularly the, the scoring that scientists don't actually see, which is the preliminary scores from each of um, the reviewers and how independent they are. If I may quickly, if I could go back to something that you were saying, Neil, that, that uh, prompted me to, to go back. As you all know, the public access open science federal guidelines have changed. Uh, as of last August, uh, the OSTP in the Alondra Nelson memo uh, was uh, intended to ensure free, immediate, and equitable access to federally funded research. And uh, we're really leaning in at NSF on the equitable part, but it brings up the issue that you raised. So we know we want to do it, but we don't know how to do it. And so one of the things that I'm proud that we're doing is we've committed to engaging the community 
we have been engaging, as you might imagine, the more resourced parts of the community. They come to us, they talk to us, et cetera. You mentioned the publishers earlier. They've been knocking at our door, but uh, research institutions and societies have been asking us what's going on. They go from agency to agency. They go to OSTP, and we say, we're talking. You don't have to come to all of us. But one of the things uh, we're trying to do is reach out to those minoritized communities and institutions who may be um, unintended, adversely consequenced by what we're doing. And so part of what we're asking is, what do you want from public access and open science? What are your fears? What, how can we be sure to help you? And one of the things I've tried to do as an NSF official working on this is to say NSF is undoubtedly going to make mistakes in how we implement the Nelson Memo. But we're here to listen to the community. And again, if it can be evidence-based, that's great. But we're willing to take opinions as well um, about what should we be doing. And what we hope is what we do in 2035 is not going to be the same as we are doing in 2025, that there'll be a lot of information that we acquire in ways that you all were talking about so that we're not ossified in what we start doing. We're going to have to implement. We're about to release our plan, which has uh, gone through OSTP review, and so we're about to make it public. Um, but part of our plan is we're going to continue planning alongside implementing. So I, I think that engagement, and, and you know, we're talking about what suffers from the open science and the meta uh, issues. We don't even know how to effectively engage communities. Uh, we've been engaging communities. The National Academies has been on the forefront of how to do that, yet there's not a really well-organized um, literature that says what works under what circumstances and why. And Brian, you and I share social psychology background. And when I grew up, that's what we were trying to do with problems, often ineffectively. But we would say, let's put this information together and let's systematically try and research so that we better understand. And I think your line of research, Dr. Nosek, not your coach, Nosek, um, has really um, helped us to see both the opportunities and the pitfalls of what we do in that systematic science. Right. Um, so all of you have hit on various aspects of things that government does or government funders do that possibly could be improved. You know, you're talking about access you know, to communities. Um, you've talked about the kind of productivity of the overall portfolio. So I wonder if, if Folks have uh, kind of an idea of like what's the future for meta science? You know, what are what are some what are the most fruitful opportunities that you would see? You know, if if you could say you know ten years from now, what will we look back on and say this this is a success that you know it's great that NIH launched an initiative to study X or to to do an experiment on Y or you know the NSF you know launched an initiative you know to do some sort of meta science uh, you know, experiment. You know, what, what, would, what would we want to look back on and say that, that was a good way to spend the past 10 years? Well, I, I think it would be a mistake if meta science stuck to studying meta science. Like, we, we fund science for, to solve really big problems in, that are facing us or to answer fundamental questions about existence, right? Really basic stuff. And we don't know how to do that well. And so we had a, a really great presentation yesterday about um, chemistry funded out of uh, China and its relative um, prestige related to other um, chem chemistry studies in the world. That's the kind of work that we should be doing for American science funders as well. We're making these big investments, enormous investments. and. It's so productive, there is so much being done that we can be, hold ourselves accountable simply by just cherry picking all the good stuff that happens from a diversified portfolio and just talking about all of that exciting stuff and the community and Congress will feel like they're getting a, a strong value for their money. But we don't talk about all the failures, 
We don't talk about the inefficiencies. We don't even have ways to measure them. And at the scale of operation we're talking about that, you just can't do that in an anecdotal qualitative way. And so what are the tools for designing a problem-focused portfolio where you're actually saying, we're going to try and solve this problem by this time, and what's the best way to do that? In the ALS space, we decided to make ALS a livable disease by 2030, and we're going to use legislative solutions and clinical solutions and research solutions to, to come to that goal. But we're really sort of feeling our way through it about what's the best way. We don't seem to have a lot of models that we can draw from. Whereas an organization like NIH or some of the other funders are working at this scale that we're working at hundreds of times a month uh, compared to our budget. And so the opportunity is there, and I think thanks in part to uh, leaders like Richard, the data are there. You can look up all of the funded grants by program announcement on Reporter, and so that's all there, and we can start to, to go through and figure out this is the right way to frame a, a research funding announcement. This is not. This turned out to be effective. This wasn't effective. Here we had the right scientists, and so we got great applications, and here we didn't have the workforce, and so maybe it's not a project solution. Maybe it's a capacity-building solution. I, I would love to, to get that feedback. I think that's a very uh, kind of grounded um, approach that we should be taking to, to an enterprise at this scale. I'd also like to caution, however, that we have a tendency to fall back upon metrics, particularly various forms of citation analysis, uh, in order to establish whether or not this or that procedure is working better, is having a greater influence. Um, just because it's easy, it's relatively easy to calculate, there's a high correlation with other kinds of measures, um, yet the behaviors that scientists have to go through in order to raise their citation rates, that metric, um, are all counterproductive, are mostly counterproductive. Um, they follow a school of thought, for instance, or get collaborators to only cite your own papers, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the least publishable unit, if you have many of them, you can increase your citation rate. So um, all of these behaviors um, are dysfunctional in science, and we need to make sure we have a broader set of criteria for what successful science like actually achieve, achieving clinical goals. So I, I think for, uh, and I've thought more about this in NSF space, what we're going to do in the meta science of open science is going to take a twofold approach. One is going to be strategic. So the equity is going to be strategic. And the other is going to be use inspired, which is the way we primarily do our uh, science funding. And so we'll hear from the community and so I think we'll, we'll try and do both. But I think both the pleasure of being a scientist as well as the frustration is we don't quite know how to do it right to achieve the outcomes we wish. Um, so I, uh, sometimes I think uh, these moonshots are, are good for galvanizing people. So though uh, cancer is still there, even though NIH is a moonshot for cancer, on the other hand, we reach the moon. So. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to do it. I'm, I will be humble, as we said earlier about this. I'd like to just add that I think it's great that in, the, in America and in Europe, um, the funding is really divided up tremendously so that there isn't one agency on which all scientists depend for funding. There are many different individuals who you can talk to to convince to fund your idea, and uh, some of them are more, would be more likely to do it. Divided responsibility for actually making funding decisions is a great blessing for, for our science. But Richard, you raise a great point, which is that the way in which we measure success in various meta-science studies might produce a perverse outcome in which we inadvertently end up like, incentivizing some of the kinds of behaviors that we all you know, kind of decry around here. So I wonder, what do we do about that kind of paradox? And it, do we need more methodological work on like how to measure 
the impact of science in a kind of broad, diverse way such that we're not incentivizing gaming one metric. Yeah, um, gaming is a real problem. Scientists are particularly good at gaming. You tell them a metric and they'll figure out how to game it, how to maximize it for, for their measures. I think um, having many different measures and having uh, different sorts of criteria um, is helpful. Uh, but I don't know what a, a final solution is because there's, there are so many, um, it, it's so attractive and easy to use a number which seems to correlate well with scientific reputation. And um, I just know that it produces lots of bad behaviors. Any other thoughts? I don't know. I, I guess it would be, I, I went to dinner with some folks on, on Monday, you know, open science experts, and one of them was talking about how they had to leave their house in the middle of the night because a forest fire was coming, and they didn't get the warning until the middle of the night, and the cell phones were down. And so if we organized our science funding not around papers but solving a problem like how do you predict when a fire is going to come so you can get out of the house on time and, and be safe? That's a real outcome. That's a tangible outcome. I think it speaks to the trust of our institutions. When Brian, when you were talking about the trust of individual scientists, trust for institutions are down across, at least in the United States, for everything. It's not just science. And in part, it's because we're talking about metrics which are only relevant to ourselves and not really for the problems to which we're funded to address, or the cultural goals or the economic goals that we're, we're funded to, to uh, address. And so if somehow we can get outside of that and get to the, the heart of why we're here, uh, I think um, we would have a lot more success. We would know when we have success, and uh, our stakeholders would as well. That's me. Um, in, in terms of like doing more experiments and more kind of internal experiments at government funding agencies. Um, I wonder if there's a way to kind of institutionalize that practice. So around nine years ago, like at the Arnold Foundation, we were involved in funding a couple of folks who worked with the social and behavioral sciences team at the Obama White House. Uh, the goal of which was to do behavioral science, you know, kind of behavioral economics experiments within government agencies to, for example, improve the rate at which uh, military service members signed up for a pension you know, to donate to their 401k. Um, and one problem with, with doing that kind of thing from the White House is that the White House you know, changes from time to time. Um, and so, and so, so what they did was they, they actually established most of that team at the General Services Administration, GSA, uh, where it's now known as the Office of Evaluation Sciences, and it still it kind of continues to this day because it's been more institutionalized and more insulated from you know, the political winds. And so I wonder if that sort of practice might make sense at NIH and NSF, if there needs to be a kind of institutional team that is thinking about new ideas, thinking about how to measure outcomes in a way that doesn't incentivize the gaming of metrics or, or that in some way ameliorates that. If, if we need to institutionalize that somehow. Any reactions? I think at um, places like NIH and NSF, it already exists to a large extent. That is, um, the senior leadership of those groups are largely uh, insulated against appoint presidential appointments. And um, they, they work to uh, balance the interests of either political party so that um, as a senior executive there, I learned to speak Republican, I learned to speak Democrat, and um, I would know what sorts of ideas to present in, which, in front of which audiences in order to show that every, every group that they would benefit from investment in research. At NSF, you know, we in the last decade or so, I forget exactly when, it was about 14 that we started, uh, we stood up an evaluation component of NSF that was primarily inward looking, we're, we're evaluating. What I've uh, come to recognize, it's really tough to do these evaluations. So you have an internal evaluation team, you have 
everybody asking them what to do. They ultimately end up doing what the director wants to know uh, because there, it's a scarce resource. And I, I don't know about uh, the other agencies, VA, NIH, et cetera, but our evaluation team is pretty small and they don't have a lot of time. And, and so I've, I've come to, again, be more modest and humble about thinking what we can achieve in government with those evaluation units. On the other hand, as you say, it, it's necessary. We do try and, and make some changes in my directorate. We wondered about uh, the funding of dissertations. So we're trying to work with some societies and different uh, entities, some former program officers, to outsource the funding of graduate students in their dissertations. So it's a trial that we're doing informally. We work with the evaluation unit on what we should be measuring. Uh, but it's, it was easier when I was an evaluator and someone was paying me and I could say, this is what you want to know. <laughs> and uh, we, Let's sign a contract and at the end of two years, I'll give you the metrics that you want. But being in charge, it's, it's actually quite tricky. Yeah, I, I agree, certainly agree with that. And you know, I did some of that work when I was in government and now that I'm outside and we have a tiny budget, spending money on evaluation of our research program is really hard. Why don't you just fund the research? And we, we actually did uh, work with um, RTI on an evaluation of, of something and I'm really glad we did it and it's, it's just very unusual. I, I do wanna hear about the funding that you guys have for, um, that you were talking about for, for MetaScience because some of the data are there and it can be more effective and flexible to do that work outside of the government through extramural funding because you get a much broader and less politically driven uh, set of evaluation questions. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful for that. And I'll just, if anyone is interested in doing that work and working with a small foundation, I, I would be happy to talk with you. And, and Mary Rose, I think is here as well from the Health Research Alliance and she may know of other partners if you're looking to work at a smaller scale than the federal government, but our data are less uh, organized usually. So we've got a little over 15 minutes left, and I want to be sure to allow some audience Q&A. So if you have a question, jump up. Yeah, there you go. I would uh, stand up. Hi, Jeff Alexander with RTI. Um, so uh, thanks for the shout out to Neil, and uh, good to see you, Alan, as well. Um, so coming from the evaluation community, the R&D evaluation community, one thing that has struck me is that I'm here because we don't use meta science techniques in evaluation typically because there seems to be a disconnect between this community and our community of evaluators. Um, but I do think, you know, we've done some very credible multivariate evaluations of research programs that don't rely just on citation analysis. So we did one for the, the Moore Foundations a few years ago. Um, so I think there is really good evaluation techniques that are available. It is expensive. But the other barrier I run into quite a bit is of course, the usual things about, well, the privacy of the proposals and confidentiality and these kinds of things. There was a lot of hope that the Evidence Act and some of the uh, regulations after that would help kind of free that up. And you see at places like Department of Labor, Department of Education, a lot of spending on evaluation and a lot of freeing up of the data. And it just seems the science agencies are unusually resistant to kind of taking the same reform steps to enable that self-evaluation. And so I'm just curious to hear your perspectives on, is there something else that has to happen in the science agencies? Is it that it's part of the culture that they are resistant to self-evaluation? Or is there you know, real reforms that can happen at a systemic level to help enable us as evaluators to do our jobs more effectively? Well, I'll say that uh, I think that there, there is reluctance uh, to do self-evaluation. However, that seems to be freeing up and uh, there is more willingness uh, to do it. I think we need outside scientists to lobby uh, for specific projects and to find individuals within the government who are willing to cooperate or collaborate um, on those projects. Um, so some people found their way to me, um, and there are others um, in the system uh, that might be open to uh, discussion. 
I'm willing to talk to individuals who might want to know some names. Let me go over there. My name is Garen Hilaire, I'm from Airdif, and uh, I had a question for you. So we were talking about projecting forward into what it's gonna look like in 2035. And when we flip that statement of uh, transparency sucks to opacity sucks in 2035, um, and we've explored how we're gonna be engaged with communities so that when we are exposing and sharing the efforts that are going on, I'm curious where your efforts are leaning toward in terms of how you will be engaging with communities over the next 10 years so that we reach that point where it's the transparency that's required for your funding to not be under threat and not an opacity that is protecting funding decisions. I'm just curious if you're thinking about how that community engagement is gonna scaffold us toward seeking that level of, of engagement. About NSF in particular? Just in general, just, just from the panel, panel perspective. How, how are we navigating towards meaningful engagement with community so that when we are transparent, it's not a transparency sucks. It's, it's transparency that's leading us in a direction that's strengthening the work. I, I would um, go ahead. I, I would say it's not about transparency for integrity. It's, it's really it's about impact and then transparency is a way of working through with the community when we achieve what we set out to or when we don't. And that's that part of integrity. But if it's not based on impact and it's only based on transparency and publications and these process measures which are not relevant to people in their everyday lives, I, I don't think we're gonna get very far. We have, to, we have to take that next step and get to people to things that they actually care about and not just things that we care about. Transparency is a part of getting to that point? I, I think it's, it's a necessary step, but it's not the end goal. And, and I think we have to keep, keep in mind that distinguish between a, a process outcome and an impact outcome, and the, we, ha, we gotta get the process right if we want the impact, but we have to talk about the impact uh, to, to broader communities. I think we also need to ultimately show that uh, openness is serving the scientific community, that's serving individual scientists that are open, uh, that they get more collaborations, that they get more ability to talk across uh, groups. And we solve some of the commercial and privacy issues that are being raised as, as um, uh, to close doors to openness. Um, I think the other thing that was a really major concern is the lack of ability to replicate or reproduce uh, uh, studies. And um, that, um, I think, serves as a strong pressure for people to be more open about what they did and how they did it. And so uh, we just need to show people that your science will be better if you're open. Over here. Hi there, uh, Terry Four with the Center for Open Science. I'm curious to know, um, in thinking of the different components of open science, so Dr. Tompkins, you mentioned uh, open infrastructure, um, open source software uh, libraries and other technologies, whether it's open access of research products, whatever the case is. Um, in your experience, in your experience is plural, uh, what uh, has at a particular agency or department, uh, how does strategy set within that particular agency in terms of which components to focus on funding? You know, for example, is it the sort of top down where the director of a particular agency uh, sets the strategy and it sort of permeates down, or is it more of a top or bottom up effort on the part of program officers? Is there any generalizability across agencies or departments, or is it just so particular to a, you know a certain agency that it's uh, that there's no generalizability? At NSF, it works both ways. So there is the top down, and there is the bottom up, and what we have is this distri distribution in, in some ways to not do that. So we, at NSF, we had fairly flat funding until recently. So the idea that we would take money and reinvest it. So the director prioritized our new TIP directorate 
and that uh, is where new monies were dedicated, flowed to that. The rest of the agency is still pretty much flat from approximately 2005 levels, so we're, we're reluctant to take away from the scientific communities because the scientific communities are feeling like what they do is important and they don't want to see a diminution of their access to funding, which they're already feeling. So they, we're kind of betwixt and between. I'm not quite sure how to extricate ourselves from that uh, problem, but I'm certainly open to recommendations. Over here. Hi, Robert Thibault from Stanford University. Uh, Neil brought up the point several times that sometimes the questions that are being answered aren't the important questions to people. Uh, and I think part of that issue is probably that the for example, in clinical trials, even if there's 50 clinical trials run on a certain topic, the average paper only cites one or two of those clinical trials that came before. So we're not necessarily build, when we're running a new study, we're not always building on what's already known. I'm wondering within any of the funding agencies, is there, is there any discussion about the funding agency actually identifying the next study that would be the important thing to move um, to advance outcomes that are important to the agency, and then actually having researchers bid to run that study and then getting funded to run that study rather than the researchers coming with their own ideas. Now, obviously, I wouldn't want all research to be done that way, but I'm wondering if there's any discussion or any models like that that are being run currently. I think NIAID was a good example where you saw a lot of leadership from an institute director um, in suggesting things for the uh, research community to pursue. Um, but there are... Um, very different policies and uh, directions uh, from each of the institute directors. So um, I, th I think there are all sorts of models out there. Uh, it would be helpful to have somebody look at, at this more systematically about how uh, institute directors influence uh, patterns. There are some who have very long track records like Dr. Fauci. Um, and, you, and you can look at whether or not certain kinds of policies and practices work better than others. Again, behavior is extremely difficult to do. It's very difficult to control. So um, this is largely uh, would be speculation. <laughs> Over here. I'd like to plus one that last question. Uh, my name is Catherine Kaiser. I'm from the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Public Health. And I'm curious, having applied to several of the agencies represented here uh, and private funding, uh, I've seen some private funders uh, also get on the um, uh, train of open science practices specifying that they're fun funded um, researchers, but they're not very not prescriptive about how you do it or where you do it or what level of auditing there may be. Um, I wonder if there's any consideration uh, to incentivize open science practice uh, adoption uh, by op optional extra page <laughs> disclosures that don't take up my 12 pages, uh, they don't take up my bio sketch, because uh, I often delete out things that I think are very important for the way I do my science because I, I, I look at what I think I'm going to be evaluated on. So I'd like to just uh, see if that's been discussed or how that might be taken. Again, there's gamification that could go on, but like I said, optional, extra free space. What do you think? Well, I, I think it's a great idea. I mean, one of the things we did when for preprints was make sure that they were allowed in the biosketch as a way of socializing a preprint as an output. But I think to put extra space in an application is, is fine, but that means that the reviewers have to value that information anyway. And well, if it were, again, you know, part of the directed thing that this, this is uh, an, an important uh, component of how this funder may wish to also make decisions between applications? So, uh, in light of the Nelson memo, there is, across the federal funders, there's going to be uh, not the traditional data management that NSF used, but it will be 
data management and sharing plans which will be uh, identified. So those are not yet at NIH. They actually have been doing that uh, a little bit longer. But NSF and the other federal funding agencies will do that. Now, the data sharing is not all your data. It's the data associated with publications. And the way that we police that, as it were, at NSF is uh, program officers may have a chance to take a look at a, um, a publication and make sure we're asking to uh, have the DOI for the data set uploaded as part of the report, the annual report. But the, we, we typically depend on the community for the new application. So did Tompkins do what he said in that previous proposal? And then you get members of the community who say, well, he didn't share that with me. I asked him to do that. And those kinds of small communities end up uh, working. I don't know. Well, we didn't evaluate it, Jeff. Uh, but uh, we, we do think that it, it, it comes up a lot so often that we do think that the community reviewers, both the panelists and the ad hocs, are paying attention to it. Also at the Center for Scientific Review, a lot of attention is paid to reviewer time. So anything that expands the obligation of the reviewer to spend more time on an application tends to n not get promoted within. Yeah, and they've been looking to streamline recently. Um, over here. Lars Huber, uh, Economics Cornell. Um, something that relates back to uh, Coach Nozick's earlier point about incentives and some of the things that have come up here. Um, you have difficulty evaluating some of the return on investment of funding in part because both the breadth and the time horizon on which you can evaluate is limited by the funding. So let me be more precise. You tend to fund a certain time period in which action occurs, but the outcomes are measured far beyond that originally funded aspect. And so there, um, there might be scope to sort of say, well, let's have all these preprints or postprints or other activities that come around be reportable or even a requirement for reporting way after the actual core funding ends. Researchers aren't going to do it for free, so that might suggest that you might have some, some small component for reporting seven, eight years out after the grant was ended because that's where some of these long-run effects uh, are going to be, be measurable thinking here of education interventions, training components, et cetera, they don't have an immediate outcome. Their outcome might be this graduate student is now publishing somewhere else years afterwards. Have there been any thoughts about sort of expanding the scope of what is reportable and when to report that? I can talk at NSF. So yes, we're, we're thinking about it. In fact, we're doing an internal inquiry asking this in the context of uh, broader societal impacts with the hypothesis, just what you're saying, uh, being that the some of the uh, policy impacts, for example, that we might anticipate don't materialize for long until long after the uh, the funding has stopped. So in terms of uh, being able to communicate it, since we have our public access repository, it can be uploaded. So if you have some kind of product, research product, uh, paper, et cetera, uh, you can lo load that even decades after um, your, your uh, proposal has, has completed. We went back 20, 25 years and just surveyed PIs and said, could you tell us what if anything has happened in policy or other societal impacts. So it's a qualitative study. I wouldn't say it's the most rigorous, but it's a preliminary start. And we were asking, hypothesizing, that much of what happens happens long after the, the award closes itself. We have less than two minutes. Maybe we can have two more questions if you speak fast. So. All right, uh, Ian Banks from the American Enterprise Institute. Brian talked about incentive structures and how uh, research institutions are responsive to the incentives of government funders. And government funders are responsive to the incentive structures that they are subject to, namely Congress. Uh, can you talk some about how uh, Congress and can, we can try and leverage Congress to shape some of those incentive structures? Well, I, I think NIH anyway, are the governance 
is uh, academics who are selected to be on advisory committees. So the interests of academic institutions are very important in federal funding, maybe more so than Congress, because again, you're talking about a very technical issue and a, a broad array of topics, and it's, it's easy to cherry pick and talk about exciting topics. And, and all the funding that happens in all of the different districts across the country when you have a diversified, decentralized portfolio. So yes, Congress can be really helpful, um, but I don't know if Congress has been sensitive to the kinds of impacts that's expected out of a funding agency other than um, grants allocated to specific districts. It's uh, tricky. One more, be quick. <laughs> Hi, right, thanks. I'm Matthew Lucas. I'm with the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. So first of all, thank you for this presentation. Really interesting. The issues you've raised and the challenges resonate north of the border, just as they do down here. Um, and I have a number of questions I'll follow up with you individually after the fact. I thought it was also interesting, though, having the funders on the stage after Brian's talk and challenge for a, a new way of doing science. So uh, I thought, thinking about change, a simple question would be, if there's one thing you could change about the way funding agencies currently do their business, what would it be? Big one. <laughs> well, for, for me, it's, it's simple. I would ask every part of a science agency to have three or four time sensitive impact goals of real world problems that they're trying to solve. I'm an advocate for basic science, so I like long term uh, goals and big issues. Uh, so. I think there's room for both, and uh, NIH fortunately funds uh, both kinds of things, and I do believe it would help to have some of them time limited. Ellen? So for NSF, we have advisory boards that we work with and report back to, so we have that set up. I don't know that it's uh, yielding exactly what you talked about, but I, I just want to mention for those of you who may not uh, be following this, but the Academy has been hosting a roundtable on aligning incentives in open science. And when we talk about those alignments and trying to move forward, they're grappling with it. And so I've been uh, just listening to those conversations now for four or five years. And I can tell you, we don't know the answers. Greg Tannenbaum and his colleagues are working with many academic institutions to try and, and move this forward. But all these comments that you've brought up are really, really difficult, which means that we should be leaning into them. And so please, I'm, for all of our agencies and the other federal agencies, uh, be a squeaky wheel. And uh, Stuart, I think, or whoever mentioned, talk to your congressional delegations and, and uh, have their support. All right, with that, that's a wrap. It's time for a break. Give a hand to our panelists. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone.